Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I'd like to tell you a story about a tree and its fruit. First, the tree, which we hear about in Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To read any of St. Paul's letters is always to be surprised. Most of the time, our quick and easy versions of the Christian faith are sweet and religious paraphrases of the powerful, majestic, and astounding message of the Bible. But this passage in Galatians 3 has to be one of the most surprising and most startling things St. Paul ever said. We talk about perfect Jesus, beautiful Savior, precious Lord. Paul talks about Jesus as a curse. Not naturally a curse, after all, he is the Son of God. But about Jesus becoming a curse, choosing to be a curse for us. Jesus chose to be the farthest possible thing from God, to be rejected and condemned by God? Why would the sinless one, the holy one, choose to do such a thing? He did it to take into himself everything that is wrong inside of us, everything that is evil, selfish, and greedy, everything that is lazy, corrupt, and cruel, Everything that lies, everything that dies, everything that hates and despises God and wants to be God in place of God. Jesus opened up his arms wide on the cross and took all these things into himself, into his very own body. They were nailed into the tree of the cross right along with his hands and feet. Jesus became the ugliest portrait of humanity imaginable. Bleeding, dying, hanging on to all that sin, a wrecked body, an empty heart, all hope gone. Of course, such a man is cursed. How could God possibly place a blessing on someone like that? We know from Deuteronomy that God abandons anyone who ends up nailed to a tree. That is the ultimate curse. And yet that's not what happened in Jesus' case. The curse was reversed. By taking into himself all the evil, all the sin, all the death, Christ forced it to die with him. Everything that hates God, dead gone, done. It has no claims anymore. It has no power anymore. The tree lives on, but its old fruit has withered up. And now new fruit is growing on the tree of the cross in place of the old fruit. Another great mystery. This tree that was death, this tree that was the cross, has turned into the tree of life. Through Jesus, the cursed tree brings forth new life. So let's talk about this fruit now, which Paul tells us about in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. It's a list of things that make us happy. They all sound wonderful. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is actually maybe harder to understand correctly even than the curse of the cross, to say nothing of the difficulty of actually bearing this fruit. Paul's argument here is as startling as that about the curse of the cross. Paul starts talking about the fruit of the Spirit only after he has talked about the works of the flesh. Now, just a warning about the words here. I don't know how it works in Swedish, but in English, flesh sounds like it simply means the body. It seems like they should be the same thing, but that's not how Paul uses these words. For him, for the whole Christian faith, the body is actually good. After all, the Son of God became a human body, and through his resurrection, we are promised the resurrection of our bodies. The problem is not the body, but the flesh. It's a metaphorical word that means the power inside of us that hates and opposes God. Yes, sometimes the flesh takes hold of our bodies and puts them to evil ends. Paul lists some of those evil uses by the flesh of the body. They are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, drunkenness, orgies. But a lot more of the works of the flesh are actually inside of our minds. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, and things like these. Now, unless you are a very willing ally of the flesh, it's not hard to see that all these things are evil. But the question is how to fight them, how to resist them how to break free of them. And whether we are Galatian Jews like in Paul's time or Christians now in the 21st century, our answer is usually the same. Keep trying harder. Keep the law. Follow the rules. Obey the commandments. Put all your efforts into it. Try harder and harder. Focus more and more energy on your own holiness until you have achieved such a state of goodness and spirituality that God recognizes your victory and gives you a blessing. That's what most of the world, Christian and otherwise, thinks that good religion is. It's only one problem with it. It's not the gospel. It is what actually St. Paul hates more than anything else. Because this message actually hates God. It doesn't want God to save us. It wants to do its own saving. It wants rewards and honors. It wants to look good to everyone else. You can try to become good by your own powers. In fact, I think you should probably try. It's an important experiment. Because either you will find out you are so proud of yourself that you don't think you really need God, and trying will be a recipe for the dramatic failure that might wake you up to the truth. Or you so despair of yourself that you honestly think God will never love you, no matter what. But the life of the Spirit does not lead to either pride or despair. Pride and despair are the results of human-made religion. The problem with both pride and despair from this kind of religion is that they look inward. But faith looks outward. It doesn't look at me. It looks at Jesus on the cross, Jesus who became a curse for me. And faith listens. It hears the good news from our Father in heaven. The Father is saying to you, not because you are my friends, but because you are my enemy. Not because you found me, but because I've found you. Not because you chose me, but because I chose you. Not because you are already holy, but because I have chosen to make you holy. That is why our Father says to us, I have baptized you in my name. That is why I sent my Son to you. That is why I place my Holy Spirit upon you. The flesh has lost the war against me. It died on that cross. You are free. You don't have to go back there again. 
It's in hearing that message, my dear friends, that the fruit of the Spirit begins to grow on the cross inside of us. It's not by our efforts to be good or holy, because when we try to do that, we are still trying to save ourselves. But when the Spirit rules our lives, the fruit is something that just starts to grow. An apple tree doesn't study how to make apples. It doesn't work at the job. It doesn't choose its soil or the rain or the sunshine. It simply exists receiving these things. Soil, rain, and sun, and even its own life as an apple tree. It didn't choose to be an apple tree after all. The result is apples, just like that. So what happens when we hear, when we really hear the news that God loves us? We can't hold on to our old hatreds anymore. Hatred is ugly. It just doesn't compare to the beauty of love. Love starts coming out of us because we have been loved. Same with joy and goodness. Maybe you used to think that joy was for ignorant people who weren't as cynical and sophisticated as you are. Maybe you distrusted joy as insincere and artificial. Same thing with peace. Peace is a good way to get hurt in this world of the violent. And it's true. Love, joy, and peace are a good way to get hurt. They got Jesus hurt. They got him on the cross. But that hurt is worth the risk if you truly know how much God loves you. That God takes joy himself in redeeming his creation. And that his goal is to restore us to the peace and goodness of his original intention for us. And so on it goes. We are patient with others because God is patient with us. We are kind to others because God is kind to us. We are good to others because God is good to us. God is faithful to us and gentle with us. God even exercises self-control with us sinners because he had the option simply to condemn us and be done with us. So in response to all these good things of God, we too become faithful, gentle, and self-controlled. You see, there's no way to skip this part in the middle. You can't just say, I should love, and therefore start to love. It just doesn't work like that. Yes, you should love, but you will only be able to love when you know that you are loved. I'm not saying it's easy to believe that you are loved by God. It's not. The flesh doesn't want to believe it, because if all this gospel stuff is true, then the flesh loses everything. And the world can't believe it because the flesh has tricked the world into believing that the flesh is the truth, while the spirit of Christ, full of love, joy, and peace, is only a dream. You can't even make yourself believe any of it. But that's okay. It's actually not your job. Faith is not a law that you have to talk yourself into obeying. All you can really do is turn your open ears in the direction of the gospel. You can let the words stream in. You can direct your eyes to the cross. The Spirit of God will win you in the Spirit's own time. Maybe the Spirit has already won you, but maybe not yet. Maybe it will happen today, or in a year, or at the end of your life. Nobody knows why or how the Holy Spirit blows. But the Spirit of Christ is faithful and patient and gentle. And the Spirit wants nothing more than to free us from the flesh through the good news about the Son of God who was made a curse for us on that tree. From that tree, the Holy Spirit will make fruit grow on all of our branches. Come Holy Spirit, make us all faithful branches of the one vine, Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. Amen.